good evening, everybody. Uh, very nice of you to join us this evening. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, spend your evening with us. And hasn't it been a beautiful day? Um, so I need to uh, just mention one or two things about this evening's event. Um, of course, um, usual story. Uh, we would love to hear your questions. Um, you're very welcome to send your questions to me via email, um, which is, and my email address is chris at wildlifeworldwide.com. And you will also see at the bottom of your screen um, two other ways that you can send me questions. Um, one is using the chat facility and the other is using the Q&A facility. And you should see at the bottom three things at the bottom of your screen, chat, um, Q&A and polling. Um, and we may well ask you all a question uh, towards the end um, of this evening's presentation. Um, it is just worth noting, I'm sorry, this is, these are, this is all um, a detail if you like, but it is just worth noting, um, one or two, we had one or two comments from people um, on the last um, event uh, that we did, which was last week, um, to say that the, the, the main image was too small. Well, if you hover your mouse to the right of the main image, you'll, you should see two white lines, vertical white lines. And if you hold your mouse button down, you can move those white lines to the right hand side and you can make your image, your principal image larger. Um, so hopefully that covers that one off um, for everybody. So please don't forget, please do ask us questions. Um, I need to give you, uh, I need to do an advertisement before I introduce Mark. Um, I need to do an advertisement um, for the next couple of events that we've got coming up. Um, first is tomorrow lunchtime, which is being given by Brian Wood. Um, and that is one of our in-depth talks about the Best of Botswana trip that we run, the Best of Botswana Safari. safari. Um, and then, uh, although I hate to plug my own talks, um, I'm also doing a presentation on Canada um, on Thursday. It's a follow-up, sort of Canada, Canada version two, follow-up to the presentation that I did um, two or three weeks ago. On to this evening. Um, I never quite know how to begin these things. Uh, and I recall um, sitting next to David Shepherd. Uh, once upon a time at a dinner um, and uh, David was about to go and do a talk um, and he was completely uh, stressed out and he turned to me and he said Chris I have absolutely no idea what it is I'm going to say but it'll probably be okay and of course it was a fantastic talk it was a fantastic presentation and I always struggle when it comes to introducing people um, particularly Mark, obviously, uh, who has had an illustrious career. Um, and, uh, ah, there he is, Hello. the man himself. <laughs> Were you hiding behind a black cloak? Well, it's not the same as walking up onto a stage, is it? You have to take your handkerchief off the camera. <laughs> and suddenly reveal yourself. <laughs> that's only because that's only you haven't got a snazzy little slider thing like I've got. <laughs> no. You need one of those. Um, Hey, just before you start, just David Shepherd, he was, a, he was a very good friend of mine, and there's a wonderful David Shepherd story I always tell where he had um, flown to Australia, and uh, he landed, and he was immediately said, you're invited to a special dinner. So he went straight to this dinner, there's 12 people at the dinner, and he was chatting to the lady on his left, and thought he'd better just say hello to the chap on, on his right. So he said, oh, hello, I'm David Shepherd, who are you? And he said, well, I'm the Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> no, no idea, no briefing, nothing. He was great. <laughs> I remember David telling me he did have a telephone call once from someone asking if he could come round, he, uh, hearing that David Shepherd was a painter, asking if he, if he could come round and do the hall stairs and landing. I <laughs> didn't, re didn't realise he was a wild David Shepherd paintings on the landing. <laughs> anyway, sorry um, to interrupt. Yes, no, no, well, you know, that's fine. Um, well, Look, we've been to Wrangell Island together, um, but of course we've also been to Baja together, um, Canada on a number of occasions. Um, we went to the Galapagos, I don't know if you can remember that far back. Can you remember back as far as 2005 when we used to be able to go away? Not really, a lot's happened since 2005. <laughs> uh, 
um, anyway, and various other places. Um, and uh, you've done quite a lot of stuff. You've written one or two books. Actually, have you written any books? I'm not quite sure. Uh, you're either always writing books or you're never writing books. I'm not um, quite sure. Yeah, I've written a couple in lockdown. I've just one. I've actually, I've just finished one, which um, was fantastic fun. I, I wanted an excuse to spend time out in the garden because I was going bonkers, and um, so I started photographing garden birds for the first time ever. You know, I never spend enough time at home in the UK. I'm always away, so it was a real pleasure learning new techniques. I ended up writing a book, which I'm not sure when it's coming out, but it's called How to Photograph Garden Birds. And did it um, take you a long time to think up the title? <laughs> well, it does what it says on the tin. And actually, you know, it was a fantastic process and, and, and uh, learned some new techniques along the way. And it was a good excuse to spend time with wildlife because, of course, the last year, like all of us, I've missed wildlife yeah. a lot. So to be able to just yeah. spend time, even with robins and chaffinches and goldfinches and, and great spotted wood, woodpeckers, has been brilliant. Which are all incredibly beautiful. And because we doing oh, yeah. wonderful things overseas we tend not to spend enough time looking at these lovely things we've got right around us yeah totally um so look mark i'm going to i'm going to hide at this point um and i'm going to leave you to leave you to take over and just a reminder to um the many people that there are on board that um we would be delighted to to answer their questions um I can say without fear or favour that uh, Wrangell Island is one of my top two, perhaps three at a push places. What are the others? Earth. Pardon? What are the others? What are the others? Ah, oh, well, one of them, of course, you will know well, um, is the Luangwa Valley in Zambia, yeah. um, <laughs> a, a, about which I'm the most appalling bore. Um, uh, and the other is the Great Bear Rainforest. Yeah, but then there's, then there's Baja, California. Which one do you choose? Goodness knows. You can't. They're all so different. You can't compare. Oh, no. I know, aren't they fantastic? Hey, look, over to you. Um, okay. I'll speak to you a bit later. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. Well, hello, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Um, it's a fantastic excuse, actually, just to rave and reminisce about what, what is one of my favourite places on the planet as well. And I know quite a few of you have, have been there already, so I hope this brings back some very happy memories. And I hope it might entice some of the rest of you to, to see Wrangell for yourselves, because it is a very, very special place. Um, before I start, I'm a relative newcomer to Wrangell myself. Um, it's been on my radar for years and years, but I first went there just in 2017, and I've been twice since then, so three times altogether. I missed last year, of course, um, but three times is enough to, to really get in the blood, and um, it's somewhere I want to keep going to time and time again. It's funny, though, when you mention Wrangell to uh, most people, <clears throat> and you say, you're going to Wrangell Island, you generally get a blank look because not that many people. I mean, I'm, you're all an exception, I'm sure, because you're informed about these kind of things. But not many people could point to Wrangell Island on a map. It's one of those almost mythical places you've vaguely heard about, but you've no idea what it is or where it is. Well, no longer because, um, oops, let me see if I might. Now that's weird, my slides not changed. That's a great start. For some reason, it's all, let me just, let's see if that works. Oh, there we are. Okay, it's working. Um, so here we are. So tonight I'm going to reveal where it is, what it is, what to expect when you go there, why Chris and I are, are raving all about it. And it's important that you do know because I hope you will get to go there. It's one of the great wildlife hotspots on the planet. So we're going to look at a few maps um, just to get started. So. Here is Wrangell, um, the, uh, the little dot there, top right hand corner of the, uh, of the map, about as far away from us in the UK as you can possibly get. And I should say, um, there we are, dots just appeared. I should say we're talking about Russian Wrangell Island, of course, um, not Wrangell Island in Alaska, Wrangell with a, a double L. Wrangell Island in Alaska is down in it's just off the map here, actually, just off the right hand. There we are. There's an arrow just going down the right hand corner, the right hand side of the Gulf of Alaska. Completely different. Well, I have to say, if we were running trips, Wrangell Island in Alaska would probably be a lot easier to organise. You can't even begin to imagine the, the, well, the number of special permits and permissions and red tape and general stuff. You have to get together to run a trip like this, which I have to say you don't have to worry about at all. It's all done for you. We do it. So let me point out a few key 
points on this map. So uh, just to get your bearings. So Wrangell Island is there. The red dot's just gone over Wrangell up in the East Siberia Sea. Um, so that is Chukotka, which is the um, Russian Far East in Russia, of course. And most of the trip is traveling around the Chukotka coastline and then around Wrangell Island up there. So from Chukotka, this is Alaska. Um, and that, of course, is the Aleutian Islands, the Aleutian Chain, another wonderful wildlife hotspot. Uh, that's the Bering Sea. Then from the Bering Sea, that's the Chukchi Sea. Over there is the East Siberian Sea. That's what Wrangell Island is in. And the Beaufort Sea over on the right-hand side. And, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the Bering Strait separating Russia from Alaska, from the United States, right in the middle there. Now, it is unbelievably remote. And um, this is another wonderful map. Um, you can see Chukotka there, top right, and Kamchatka just down below it. That whole region of the Russian Far East is it's a, it's a wonderful part of the world for wildlife watching. Um, very remote, both of them. And I, I've spent a lot of time in Kamchatka as well, which is also truly wonderful for wildlife. Um, this is me, different life altogether, on an anti-poaching patrol in the Taiga, T-A-I-G-A forest um, in Kamchatka in the Russian Far East, uh, trying to protect Siberian tigers. There's about 500 of them left in the forest there. Um, I spent quite a lot of time running tours in Kamchatka as well. This is a, a Kamchatka brown bear, which is a particular subspecies of brown bear, grizzly bear only occurs in this part of the world. And it's a very wild, spectacular coastline, uh, very similar to, Cam uh, to Chukotka in many ways. But of course, Chukotka is our, our focus for tonight. And it's one of four what are called um, autonomous regions in Russia. So it's part of Russia, but it's given some autonomy uh, to the indigenous people who, who live there. And it's funny, really, I think one thing I love about this is that we think of Chukotka as remote, but the whole of Siberia is remote to us. Siberia is this, this vast stretch of Russia um, that goes all the way from the Ural Mountains in the west, all the way to the Sea of Okhotsk and the Bering Sea in the east. Well, we think of Siberia as, as remote, but the Siberians talk about, I mean, Siberia is, is it's, it's the word we use for remote. It's, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's the symbolic of remote. But the Siberians talk about Chukotka as being remote. So by Siberian standards, Chukotka is remote. And the Chukchi, the people who live in Chukotka, they think of Wrangell as remote. So Wrangell is remote even by Siberian standards. You can't say that about that many places um, on the planet. So here's one more map. So it might be remote from that point of view, but actually, it's, it's very close to not a million miles from North America. I mean, to quote Sarah Palin, don't know whatever happened to Sarah Palin, when she was governor of Alaska, uh, she sort of got the idea right. I'm not sure if she was, she was quite right in the way she was thinking. But you can see Russia from parts of Alaska. They're separated by the Bering Strait, as you can see. At its narrowest point, the Bering Strait is only 50 miles across. And the border between Russia and, and North America, of course, runs right down the middle there, uh, the dotted line. Used to call it the, the Ice Curtain. And so it's, the border is very, very close. Here's a satellite view of that same region. Now, if you look, um, I'm going to see if I, this will point will work here. Um, hopefully this is going to work. There we are. That point there, you can just see inside there, there are two little islands. Um, they're the Diomedes Islands. Uh, very sparsely populated. The big Diomede is the bigger one on the Russian side. And then the other side of the border um, is Little Diomede, which is part of the United States. Um, that big island down there um, covered in cloud is St. Lawrence Island, another great wildlife spot belonging to Alaska. Anyway, at their closest, these two islands are just about two and a half miles apart, which means on a clear day, you can definitely see Russia from the states or the states from Russia. And they're split in half by the international date line. So they're also known as the, the today and tomorrow islands. And you can actually travel backwards and forwards in time if you cross from one to the other. I remember the most extraordinary flight I did a few years ago 
from Anadir, which is just off the map there on the left in the cloud, um, in a tiny little plane. I flew from Anadir and left Anadir in the pouring rain. It was um, a grey day. It's a very Russian airport, all these officials wearing flat hats and going around with Kalashnikovs and so on. I took off. We had the most horrendous, stormy, bouncy flight being thrown around all over the place. And then just a few hours later, landed in Nome, which is just down, if you look down just to the right of that uh, circle I put on the map on the Alaska um, coast, that's Nome. Landed in Nome, it was bright sunshine. Nome is the, the wild west and there's a little hut um, um, where there's just one man on duty to do immigration. And of course I landed the day before I left. It was just like a, an out of body experience, quite an extraordinary thing, gave me a sort of a weird sense of these two worlds so close yet so far apart. So I guess one of the big questions is how does Wrangell compare with other parts of the Arctic, especially for wildlife watching, which is what I guess most people are interested in. Well, um, I've, had lots of, I've got lots of favourite places in the Arctic uh, for all sorts of different reasons, and it's like choosing your, your favourite place on the planet. It's actually really difficult to choose a favourite place in the Arctic because while there are lots of similarities, um, there are also lots of differences and it'd be impossible to pick one above all the others, I think, just because they're all very special in their, their different ways. This is a, a polar bear in Svalbard and I guess that's the place that, that most people think of when they think they want to see polar bears and it is, it is pretty good for polar bears Svalbard, I have to say, so, you know, a lot of very good encounters there. It's also very good for Arctic foxes, and I've had some wonderful luck with Arctic foxes in Svalbard too. It's got some amazing um, seabird colonies with spectacular numbers of seabirds. These are all, uh, or mostly these are kittiwakes and uh, glaucous gulls. So something completely different is Arctic Canada. This is Nunavut, so actually uh, northern Baffin Island. And I'd say Arctic Canada perhaps has more spectacular scenery. Um, it's a very, very dramatic place to explore. It's also wonderful for polar bears. Um, lots of polar bears in Nunavut generally, particularly around Baffin Island. And of course, uh, it has species that you, you can get to see in Svalbard. In fact, this is one of the few species you don't get to see in Wrangell either. This is a, a male narwhal, or a, yeah, this is a male narwhal. Um, I don't normally shoot black and white, but it, it was such a, a sort of bleak day, black and white, I think it seems to work quite well for this. This was taken lying down on the flow edge, about a five hour skidoo ride from Pond Inlet on the north coast of Baffin Island, which is probably the best place on the planet for seeing narwhal. They're mainly in the, the um, North Atlantic side of the Arctic and they do in theory stretch as far as, as Wrangell Island, but you generally don't see them there. So if you want to see narwhal, North America, Baffin Island, Nunavut is the area to go. Um, none of, uh, sorry, um, muskox as well is another uh, speciality of that region. Another one you can also see in Wrangell. So there are differences in the species you see depending on where you go. And even if you go to somewhere like, this is the, the high Arctic in, in Northern Norway on the mainland, even that has its own specialities. It's, it's one of the best places to go and see killer whales and a, a variety of other whales as well. This is a, a sperm whale with the rising moon in the background. You can't believe the work went into trying to try and get the two together. Looks easy, but it wasn't. Um, so why would you go to Wrangell? Well, Wrangell has all the things except Narwhal, as I said, all the things I've just talked about, spectacular scenery, uh, fantastic landscapes, wonderful, huge numbers of polar bears, muskox, got whales and, and some very spectacular whales, all in exceptional numbers and a heck of a lot, heck of a lot more. And one of the reasons I love Nar uh, Wrangell as well is because it's got far, far fewer people. And I'll talk about that in a moment. You, you just don't see other people. And to me, one of the old reasons for going to wilderness areas to see wildlife is to do it not with crowds and get away from tourists. And, and Wrangell is definitely off the tourist trail. I'd also say that the, the journey to Wrangell is uh, a big part of the trip. And um, it takes a while to get there, but once you're on the ship, the, the actual journey around the Chukotka coastline uh, and through the Bering Strait 
is, is really quite spectacular. These are some of the places that we try to stop off along the way. And I'll show you a few pictures from some of them. Um, and it's a, a truly wonderful journey. It'd be worth going all that way just to do the Chukotka coastline, even if you never actually got to Wrangell. So it's a pretty special place. So you begin by flying to Moscow. Um, I've been going to Moscow a lot over the years. I first went in 1990. That was a pretty, um, that was still in the Soviet days, pretty amazing uh, trip. I'll never, I, won't, I won't tell you the story now, it involves a Russian jail. Maybe I'll tell you that over a beer sometime on the, on the ship around the Chukotka coast. Um, but it's a, a very interesting city, spend a, a day or two there. And um, then you basically have to fly. Don't worry, it's not that plane. That was the only symbol I could find, but um, it's a bigger plane than that. Uh, you fly from Moscow all the way across Russia. Pretty amazing flight to do up to Anadir over there in the Russian Far East. Now, I think, I think Russia's got 11 time zones altogether. And on that flight, we fly over nine time zones, 3,847 miles. And we land in this amazing remote port of Anadir in the Russian Far East. And that's where we, we join the ship. So here's Anadir. It's the sort of capital, if you like, of Chukotka. It's the most easterly point of Eurasia. It's still only at um, 64 degrees north. So it's still below the, quite a way below the Arctic Circle. Um, but the best thing about Anadir is the river. And we get from the airport, we travel to the ship at the wharf um, on the other the river from Anadir itself. And you just go to the other side of the ship at the water side and they're right there. Um, first thing you see you might be spotted seals, a lot of spots in the estuary there. But the Anadir River estuary is also to that gather in those chalices every feeding mainly on salmon. And, and it's the belugas and spotted seals that the first thing we see. Chukotka is a, is a vast region. Um, it's a tough region to live. The, the, the winter season here lasts for about 10 months, really. And the average annual temperature is about minus 14 degrees centigrade. So I mean, when we're there in the height of the summer, it's not, not bad at all. It's actually comfortably warm. I wouldn't say it's hot like, like T-shirt weather, although it can be, um, but it's certainly well above zero. And that whole region that you can see there, the pink region, Chukotka, is roughly the size of England and France combined. Yet it's home to fewer than 50,000 people, the Chukchi. So it's actually the most sparsely populated region in the whole of Russia. And, and Anadir, um, which is highlighted there, is the, uh, the biggest town with about a third of that 50,000 population. And there are a few other um, small towns. So one that we visit is Lavrentia, which is just highlighted over there, which is a, a very small town. It's an old 1920s Soviet outpost, just below the Arctic Circle, um, with a population of, of certainly fewer than 1,500. I think it's closer to 1,000 nowadays. And it's pretty much overlooking the, the Bering Strait. So Lavrentia is interesting because it sits on a, a geographical crossroads, if you like. It's between the the Arctic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean is between the Chukchi Sea and the Bering Sea, um, between the North American continent and the Eurasian continent. And of course, it's close to the international date line. So it separates yesterday from tomorrow, if you see what I mean. The one thing I don't like about Lavrentia, it's one of the few places um, in Chukotka where grey whales are still being hunted. And under IWC International Whaling, uh, Commission regulations, the Chukchi are allowed to take about 140 or up to 140 grey whales every year. And it's, a, it's a wild place to live and there are people in Chukotka who are genuinely living off the land. I have, I have mixed feelings about this Aboriginal whaling. Um, the trouble is the IWC uses a, a less precautionary approach, I would say, to setting the quotas for Aboriginal whaling compared with commercial whaling. Um, and, and I'm certainly concerned, as, as are many other people, that some of the quotas are too high. Uh, there's a sort of blurred line between commercial whale products and traditional whale products. So some of them are being sold, particularly in Greenland and, and Canada. Um, some communities don't actually rely on whale products to survive. So in Lavrentia, for example, there's actually a big supermarket. So there is access to 
Western food and food from other parts of Russia. And the killing methods you can see are on these Aboriginal hunts are even less humane than those on commercial hunts. But that's a, another whole story. In between um, those few towns, you've got this wonderful vast wilderness. And as I say, one of the special things about this whole trip is that you just don't bump into other people most of the way. Just a few small groups of um, reindeer herders and marine mammal hunters and people fishing and doing some other hunting. But once you've taken away the people, you know, 50,000 population that are in those few towns, there are very few people left over that, that vast area. It's very difficult to know where to begin um, to talk about the wildlife because there's so much and it's so varied. Uh, the whale watching can be fantastic and that's one of my big passions. The entire region is a major feeding ground for whales. And I'd say grey whales are probably the, the commonest, they're probably the commonest baleen whales in the eastern Russian Arctic. And um, these are very special whales, close to my heart, and I know lots of other people's hearts. And I know it's very hard to believe, but these are the very same grey whales that many of us have tickled and scratched in San Ignacio Lagoon on their, on their breeding grounds. That's in Baja California in Mexico that, uh, that Chris mentioned earlier. Um, and these same grey whales that, that lie by the side of our boat so we can scratch and tickle, um, and they wait there to be scratched and tickled, make this phenomenal journey. Um, if you have a look down at the bottom right, you'll see the, the purple movie area. I can never tell the difference. Um, uh, off Baja, that's the breeding ground. So they, they breed there in the winter and then they migrate all the way up the coast of North America. They go through the um, Aleutian Islands into the Bering Sea. And then some of them go through the Bering Strait and all the way up to Wrangell Island up there, top left of the, the orangey um, colour. Um, and that distance from San Ignacio to Wrangell Island is about 6,000 miles. <laughs> What's amazing, they just swim there. We have this incredible journey in cars and planes and buses and ships to get there. The grey whales just swim there. Then they swim all the way back again, ready to breed again the following winter. It's quite amazing. There's actually a small population of um, grey whales uh, in Russia um, and the Western Pacific, uh, much, much rarer. There's, there's just fewer than 100 or so. Um, this is a, a terrible photo, I know, but it is a Western grey whale, as they're called. My only reasonable photo of a Western grey whale. That was in the Sea of Okhotsk, taken a couple of years ago. And they breed, we don't know where, further south, maybe off Hainan Island in China. Um, but it's, it's interesting, there's a whole other population. The ones we see on this trip are basically from the middle of Kamchatka north, so all of Chukotka and Wrangell Island are the eastern grey whales that, that breed in Baja. But the jewel in the crown of the whale watching uh, for me is, is this, the bowhead whale, um, which is the next most common whale in the region. And I've, I've looked for bowheads and watched bowheads in many different parts of the Arctic, but I've got to say, I've actually had more luck finding them and getting nice close encounters with them on this journey between Anadir and Wrangell than anywhere else in the Arctic. And if I had to pick one encounter, th this was phenomenal. We had a couple of years ago, we had, we had I think, probably hundreds of grey whales, humpback whales and bowheads just around the ship as far as you could see blows and bodies coming up. It was a phenomenal experience. And we stopped, of course. And this bowhead whale came and surfaced right next to the, the bow, next to the ship. Um, it was the most wonderful encounter, flat, calm seas. That, that is the way to see a bowhead whale. If you have a look at the, the tail, can you just see the tail on the bottom left? See, it looks quite white, quite light under the surface there. Well, that's an indication that this particular bowhead whale is quite um, old. And uh, see if we've got a closer look, there we are. The tail and the tail stock, as it's called, um, is actually really quite light colored and quite, quite white. And uh, that's an indication that the whale is getting on. And um, bowheads are renowned for reaping a, a, reaching a ripe old age. And just to compare with people, I had a little look and the oldest authenticated age for any human being was for American Sarah Naus, who, who died in 1999. When she died, she was 119 years, 97 days old, which is pretty impressive. I mean, goodness knows how she did it. Not living on coffee and red wine, I would think would help. Um, but we're using 
studies of bowhead whale to try and learn about longevity and to learn about how it might be able to help humans to live for longer because they have a few remarkable features. They have remarkable disease resistance. They've got a, an anti-tumor response to reduce the chance of getting um, cancer. They've got an amazing ability to renew their DNA and, and so on. And so you might expect them to live a reasonable age. And there are tried and tested techniques for aging whales. And using those, we found the oldest bowhead whale studied so far, which was one that was killed by whalers in Alaska. So it was still healthy and still living and hunting and swimming and everything else was 211 years old. More impressive than that, even that there's some recent studies just published of, of genome predictors of lifespan looking at the DNA, and they basically have estimated that the maximum theoretical lifespan of a bowhead whale is 268 years. So amazing whales, and seeing those is always one of the highlights of the trip. There's also lots of uh, humpbacks, see those a lot during this little journey up to Wrangell Island, as well as fin whales and minke whales, killer whales, and, and all sorts of other species. There are lots of seabird colonies along the way, another big highlight of the journey. And they include quite a lot of species that we don't get if you're from the, the UK, I know a lot, a lot of you aren't, but if, if those of us in the UK, we don't get a lot of these species in the North Atlantic, like tufted puffins there and um, horned puffins. I, I do love photographing against the light, nice dark background, light shining through all the spray, puffin takes off, just fire away and occasionally get a shot where all the spray is just perfect and lit up. Um, they're, they're wonderful, very photogenic birds. Um, and we spend a lot of time watching horned puffins on their uh, incredible uh, nesting cliffs. And often it's the cliffs, of course, the colours of the rocks and all that kind of thing that, that uh, make the phot photography so special. I love all the shapes and the colours. The puffin is almost, almost not quite incidental. And loads of other seabirds as well, parakeet orclets, various other orclet species and uh, ones that, that we don't get in the North Atlantic and pigeon guillemots is another one. And, and familiar species as well, um, black leg kittiwakes, lots of huge colonies of those, great opportunities for watching and, and photographing kittiwakes. There's another black and white one. It just worked, I, this just works in black and white, it was very deep in shadow, so I've exaggerated the shadow. The, the bird droppings on the rocks didn't look great in colour, um, but when, when it, I turn it to black and white, it looks almost like icing on a cake. And for me, what makes this particular photo is that the shape of the two birds on the left hand side, though, just perfect. It's one of those reasons you've got to take lots of photos and the odd one, it just works. There's no overlap. All the other pictures in that sequence, um, there was overlap and it just ruined the shot. There's some wonderful landing sites as well. And we do go ashore en route just to break it all up. This is Cape Dejneff, which is the, uh, oh dear, I've seen a dust spot on the left-hand side there. That's terrible, a bit sloppy, sorry about that. Um, that's the northeasternmost point of the Eurasian continent. And this is only about 50 miles from Alaska. This is, this is really the closest point to, uh, or one of the closest points to North America. And you can, on a good day by climbing up really high, someone see the coast of North America, Cape of, Prince Wales in Alaska across the Bering Strait. Cape Dejneff steeped in history, but I won't, I won't go into all that now. Um, it's also teeming with tame Arctic ground squirrels, and that's an animal we get used to on this trip. They're pretty much everywhere, except ironically, except Wrangell itself. Um, and they're wonderful for watching and photographing. You can just sit with Arctic ground squirrels and they will come right up to you. They'll do their thing all around you, not bothered, bothered by people at all. You can just sit down quietly, find your own little group of Arctic ground squirrels away from everybody else and watch these amazing animals as they go about their thing. This was actually at the camp with that, that family I showed you the picture of with their teepee. And they had a kitten. It never caught the ground squirrels. They were much too quick, but it kept, there was, there was a ground squirrel living in the pipe and the kitten kept creeping up on it. The squirrel would just dive in at the last minute. Um, great fun, I could have spent all landing just watching. In fact, they did spend most of that landing just watching that. Um, and they're in a lot of the ruins of old huts and that kind of thing. They're, they're everywhere. This is uh, Whalebone Alley, um, which was a centuries ago a major butchering 
uh, and storing ground for whale meat by local communities. And there are all these bowhead whale um, bones and skulls and that kind of thing littered along the beach. There's always wildlife as well, of course. You go somewhere and the main focus is the, the whale bones, but at the back of the whale bones, there's a scree slope. And you can hear these, these weird um, high-pitched sort of um, peak sounds. Peep, peep, I, can't, I can't mimic it. It sounds like a small bird, and it's being made by these animals. These, this is a peaker, and this scree slope is fantastic for peakers. They're very difficult to see, because they see that the colour is very similar, almost identical to some of that orange lichen. And when they're staying still, if you just look staring at a vast scree slope, it's almost impossible to see them. So you have to listen for that high-pitched sound and look for their movement. As soon as they move, you spot them and then you've got to keep your eye on it and then you can see it. They're a bit more nervous than the, the ground squirrels, but uh, once one's sitting calmly, if you move slowly, um, they quite easily get close enough to, to photograph. And then this is, um, really a sort of kicking off point to Wrangell Island, this Koliuchin Island, tiny island off the north coast of Chukotka. Um, and this is within striking distance of Wrangell. That's the great Joe Cornish. James. I think Joe is going to be watching tonight. Hello, Joe. Um, fantastic landscape photographer. I'm, I'm sure you all know shooting yet another masterpiece. It's hilarious. Joe goes ashore and he takes three photos and they're all amazing. I go ashore doing wildlife photography and take 3,000 photos, of which maybe a few are good, but a whole different way of operating. Joe sets up, manoeuvres, walks about, paces around, looks at it, does all the things landscape photographers do, and takes three, but they're all, all prize-winning shots, very annoying. Um, just kidding, Joe. So Koliuchin Island is now north of the Arctic Circle. It's about 67 degrees north. Um, so we're finally in the Arctic, and it's a great place for as you can see, seabird colonies, spectacular cliffs, there's walrus haulouts, and there's actually polar bears. I remember one year we, we went, and we were just about to land, we were just scanning, checking for polar bears, and we saw one, and then we saw another one. And in fact, in one little spot where we were going to walk to, there were 13 polar bears on this tiny island. So we wisely decided not to land at all, and we just did a zodiac cruise and watched the bears and saw some walruses and did some seabird watching and that kind of thing. So we then crossed the, the East Siberian Sea to uh, Wrangell Island. Wrangell Island is 435 miles north of Anadir, 87 miles from the Siberian mainland. And it, its northernmost point is at 71 degrees 39 minutes north. So it's roughly speaking 350 miles north of the Arctic Circle. So really true Arctic. Quite a small island. we well, say that it's about three times the size of the Isle of Wight, if that helps. Um, so it's about 78 miles at the, the widest and 30 at the longest, rather, 37 miles from top to bottom. And most of Wrangell, and there's a little island you'll see over on the right hand side, that's Herald Island, which is about 37 miles to the east, also wonderful for, for wildlife. So most of Wrangell and Herald and most of the sea around them, um, up to about 24 nautical miles offshore, uh, are all protected. They, they're a part of a Russian federal nature reserve and, and a World Heritage site, and that actually gives them the highest level of protection you can get in Russia. And it, it precludes all human activity, almost all human activity, other than for scientific purposes. So we approach Wrangell from the south, of course, and we go down on the south coast, pick up three rangers, and they accompany us throughout the whole time on the island. I mean, protecting us from bears and, and helping us find wildlife, because of course they know Wrangell better than anybody, and uh, keeping an eye on us, making sure we don't do anything silly. Um, and then we generally circumnavigate the island. So most times we'll go round the island and uh, out to a Herald, and then drop the rangers off and start heading, heading south again. So for centuries, Wrangell was actually well, it was little more than a rumour, it was a mirage, like a fog haze dream, and there were all sorts of theories, maybe it was an island, maybe it was a continent, perhaps it was some magical gateway to the North Pole. And of course the original Aboriginal, in, original Aboriginal inhabitants of Chukotka had known about it for centuries, in fact for thousands of years before the Europeans discovered it. Um, they hunted on Wrangell in prehistoric times, but Europeans discovered it was named after the Russian explorer 
Baron Ferdinand von Wrangel, who was mapping the Siberian coast in the early 1820s. He never actually set foot on Wrangel, but he, he heard about it from all the local people. And there are no native people living there, uh, no native population. No one lives there permanently. There's a very small military base in the southeast corner, which is typical Russian. Many, many parts of the Russian Arctic have, have military bases of various sizes. And there's a small team of rangers who live practically next door to the military base. So anything from a dozen to a couple of dozen people altogether, something like that, on the island at any one time. I say nobody lives there permanently, but there is one ranger called Igor, who I've met each time I've been, and he's been living on Wrangell for nearly 40 years. And he, like the others, he gets a shower, and if he's lucky, a sauna and emails at the military base once a week. And there's a doctor at the base too, that there's an emergency. Generally, people would have to be helicoptered back to the mainland. So the lady you see there in the, the top of the picture is Uliana, who's the only researcher on Wrangell. Um, her main interest, despite all the polar bears and the walruses and so on, her interest is snow geese. And she spends every year on Wrangell studying the snow geese. And it's home to, well, it's the only surviving major colony of lesser snow geese in, in the whole of Eurasia. And the numbers fluctuate, but in, in recent years, something like 350,000 snow geese return, mostly to one particular valley on Wrangell every summer. To breed and that's that's Uliana's main interest. I remember I remember chatting to Uliana one visit about you know life on Wrangell and she came up with a wonderful line she said Wrangell has lopped off everything superfluous in other words it's made us see what's important in life and, and what's not important. Wrangell has lopped off everything superfluous and she said her plan in life is to spend as much time there as she possibly can. So the seas around Wrangell are rarely free from ice. Just a few months in the height of summer, it, as time goes on, there's less ice, I have to say, with global warming. It's a big issue for the polar bears, of course, but it's still only a few months in the summer. And it's the ice where you get to see a lot of the wildlife, of course. And I could, I could happily spend the entire two week trip doing nothing but cruising through the ice around Wrangell, even, with, uh, even without setting foot on the magical island itself. One of the highlights of ice searching is walruses, and Wrangell's actually home to the largest population of Pacific walruses in the world, with literally tens of thousands of them around the island every summer. They, they, they move south into the Bering Sea in the winter. Most of them around Wrangell are females and young adults. Um, not all of them, but most. A lot of the adult males stay further south on, on haulouts in the Bering Sea. And the photographic opportunities are wonderful because you've got this fantastic backdrop. It's not just an empty background, you've got this wonderful island behind them. Here's a close up of a, a walrus. Tusks, of course, most noticeable feature. They're, they're in both the sexes, males and the females, the upper canines. Um, used for all sorts of things. They're like, I know, they're like uh, Swiss army knives for walruses. They use them, what, they, they signify status to a degree. They're also used as weapons and um, headrests even for making holes in the ice and for ice picks and all sorts of things. Remember in um, 2019, we had the most extraordinary encounter. We were on an icebreaker, a bigger ship than we normally use. And it had this wonderful deck high up, just below the bridge um, on the outside. And, and I happened to be on this deck and suddenly this, this herd or pod of walruses just appeared alongside the ship, beautiful calm water. And it was almost like looking down on them from the air, like shooting them with the cameras, like um, taking aerials. Um, and we saw the most amazing sight. I mean, you just don't get to see walruses like this very often. Here's the group as it went just, just past the, uh, the little platform I was on. They've got blows like small whales, interestingly, walruses. If you, you can see a herd of walruses in the distance, you think, whales, whales. And it's, uh, it's just these little puffs of breath that they make. I've just seen another dust spot. I could have worked harder on that. Um, this shot would have been fantastic. This was the same encounter. Lovely, lovely view of the walrus. Again, unlike most views of walrus you ever get, that perfect halo, but it's ruined by the, the, um, the damn flipper sticking out from underneath the body. You could get rid of that in Photoshop, I can hear you say, but I don't believe in doing that. 
I think you lose the magic. If you Photoshop stuff like that out, you're on a slippery slope. Um, you, you, you know, I think the, the magic of wildlife photography is that you, you look at a photograph, you imagine being there and you marvel at the skill of the photographer. And if you're thinking, oh, well, that's too good to be true, he or she's Photoshopped that or added something or done that, then all the magic goes. So I'm leaving the flipper and moaning about it instead of uh, Photoshopping it out. But of course, it's polar bears that everybody really wants to see when they go to the Arctic. And I can honestly say that I've never been anywhere in the Arctic with more polar bears and more polar bear sightings than Wrangell Island. Um, you just have to basically poke your nose or the bow of your ship into the ice and the chances are you'll find some polar bears pretty damn quickly. And of course, they stay on the ice as long as they can, hunting for seals. Um, and as the ice melts, they, they gradually move ashore. But Wrangell has the highest density of polar bear dens anywhere in the world. Some, some, I've seen some figures of 500 dens. I think it's more like 300, 350, but it's still pretty impressive with that many polar bears denning on Wrangell. In a, in a typical year, it's known as the, the polar bear maternity ward. And there's another hundred or so, this is part of, Her that's not Herald Island, it's just a, a rocky outcrop off Herald Island, that little island to the east of Wrangell. Um, and there's another hundred or so dens typically on, on Herald. So it's quite amazing. It's not surprising that it, some days it feels like they're literally everywhere. I remember we did a Zodiac cruise around Herald Island one year and uh, it's a tiny island, it's about four square miles. And on this one three hour Zodiac cruise, we saw 29 polar bears, mostly mothers and, and um, cubs like, like we saw. In fact, in the past, we've stopped announcing polar bears on the speaker system on the ship, because there were just so many, we've, we've, we've waited, you know, obviously you see the first few, but we've then waited a bit, been a bit more picky to get them on the best, the cleanest ice or the best looking bears or mothers with cubs or anything like that. Because if you stop for every single bear you see, you'd, you'd never get anywhere. I mean, you, you, you know, you do see a lot and it's, it's one of the best things about the approach to Wrangell and the traveling around Wrangell. You don't need to rush ashore. A lot of the wildlife is before you get there. As I say, one of the big problems in the whole of the Arctic is that this ice is less reliable. So it's actually, thawing earlier in the summer and it's freezing later so there's more time without ice when the bears can't hunt seals um, in some years at Wrangell it's actually retreated so far north that it's gone to 80 degrees north so nine degrees beyond the north of the the coast of the north coast of Wrangell which is really pretty serious and of course the longer that goes on the more the bears have to spend time ashore and they can't hunt seals ashore they're feeding on carrion um, and they're hunting anything they can find from walruses to, to lemmings. Um, in fact, there are so many some years that, that and they're obviously doing okay, and this bear looks pretty healthy. Um, I wasn't on the trip, but one trip, I think it was the one after one of ours, everybody was, was just looking at the island, cruising on the ship, and they saw what looked like a whole load of sheep in a field. And when they looked closer, it was polar bears. I think I've got the figure right. There were 241 polar bears in view at one time on this one strip of land on the side of Wrangell. They, they literally did look like sheep in the field. So we do obviously spend time ashore. This is a, the ship we've been using mostly. This is the Spirit of Enderby, um, which is a lovely ship, takes just 50 passengers. I think the next trip we do, we're going to be using the sister ship, uh, the Schakowsky, which is almost identical, takes 48 passengers looks the same, you wouldn't be able to tell the two apart, apart from the name. Um, so we use that and we, we, we do go ashore as much as we can using uh, Zodiacs as you would anywhere else in the, the Arctic doing this kind of thing. Here we are landing on a deserted beach. And let me tell you just before I finish a little bit about what to expect when we get ashore. Spectacular landscapes, um, some fantastic huts as well. There's some abandoned huts from people who have, have lived there for short periods of time. Um, some with polar bear claw marks, rape marks, signs of polar bears everywhere, I have to say. And some beautiful flowers. I'm not very good on my plants, but there are more than 400 species of uh, 
flower on the island, or plant rather. Um, you might be lucky and find some signs of mammoths even. Uh, this is a mammoth tooth and uh, there are quite a few tusks. Tusks are being revealed much more in uh, Siberia as, as the permafrost where they're buried, they're buried in the permafrost as the permafrost melts with global warming. More and more mammoth tusks are being revealed and it's actually become quite an issue because they're being traded and you can't really tell the difference between a mammoth tusk and an elephant tusk. That's another whole long story but Mammoths lived on Wrangell Island. In fact, Wrangell was the last place on the planet where mammoths lived. Um, and they were there until about 3,700 years ago, something like that, so not that long ago, really. And there was a population of 500 to 1,000 living on Wrangell long after they disappeared everywhere else in the world. So Wrangell was the, literally the last home of the, of the woolly mammoth. Also, many more birds, um, over 40 species, uh, nest regularly on and around Wrangell Island and in vast numbers, some of them in hundreds of thousands, like the snow geese, like some of the uh, breeding seabirds. It's home of some of the biggest seabird colonies in the Chukchi Sea. Um, lots of black legged kittiwakes, king eiders are very common. Um, there's several species of passerine, long, Lapland longspur, uh, as well as snow bunting and hoary red pole. Um, Snowy owl is, is the most likely bird of prey, if you like. We do see those, this is um, quite heavily cropped. They're quite nervous on Wrangell. While we see them quite a lot, they're very hard to get close to. We do occasionally see other birds of prey like cheer falcons, seen a peregrine once, I think seen a, a rough legged buzzard once, but, but um, snowy owls are the main ones we, we see. And all sorts of um, mammals, I mentioned muskox, um, they were actually introduced to Wrangell from Alaska in the mid-1970s, 1975. I think it was 60 were introduced originally, and now there's over a thousand, and the population remains quite stable. So you do see they were there in prehistoric times, so it's a, it's a natural species for Wrangell. Um, and you do see them quite a lot. I remember this one, it was hilarious. We saw it and we were on shore and we thought, why don't we try and stalk it? And there were probably, there were over 50 of us, including the staff, probably 53 people. And um, we zigzagged and crawled along the ground and thinking, yeah, I can hear people saying, no way is this going to work. This is going to work. It's a waste of time. There's too many of us. And we crawled and crawled. And we got to within shooting distance of it, camp shooting distance of it. And it just stood there and looked at us, even wandered closest to us at one point. We're all giggling and, and laughing and in the end, standing up and chatting. It wasn't bothered at all. So there's everything from muskox to um, lemmings. There are two species of lemming, both endemic, or well one, uh, one is endemic, that's the Wrangell Island collared lemming. The other one is a subspecies of the Siberian lemming, which is endemic uh, to Wrangell Island. This is the Siberian subspecies. And they're of course critical to a lot of the other wildlife there. So they're a major food source for the um, snowy owls and for skewers and Arctic foxes and so on. And there are, there are reindeer and um, you don't see them very often. You don't see Arctic foxes that often or red foxes, they're there. Occasionally we see wolverines. Um, they hunt the reindeer and they feed on the, the snow geese. Um, generally at a distance, you don't get great views of, of the wolverines. There are wolves and I know people who've seen wolves there and Uliana sees them quite regularly, but it's very small numbers. Uh, they got there themselves by walking across the ice. Some of them are hybrids. Um, they're the offspring of a, it's a local male dog that I think lives on the military base and a female wolf. Um, but there are genuinely purebred wild ones there as well. So altogether there's, there's eight species of mammal living on the land. So don't forget to look out to sea as well. Never forget the whales. This is a, a cliff top. We were looking at the seabirds actually. And um, I was down over, out of sight, down on the right hand side there, not actually on the cliff top. I think I was photographing lichens or something. And all these people on the cliff top suddenly started calling, there's a whale. And um, I could hear all this excited chatter. And this next shot is not mine. I have to thank Anne-Marie Smith, who's very kindly um, lent it to me. This is a grey whale right below the cliff feeding in such shallow water, you can see its flippers just about to come out of the surface. Oh my God, I wish I'd seen that, let alone taking the photos. It's doing what grey whales do, so it's, it's rolled over onto its right-hand side. Most grey whales are right-handed. 
and it's scooping up the seabed and sieving out all that that um, all the pebbles and the mud and the the sand and everything, and um, eating the little little creatures that are living inside the seabed. And to see that from the cliff top was absolutely amazing. So Anne Marie took that wonderful shot while I was sprinting across the tundra, and I, I saw the whale, but it had stopped feeding and was just swimming off into the distance. Oh, and I've, I think I've mentioned polar bears, haven't I? They're everywhere. Or did I say that already? So we often see polar bears while we're on shore, and uh, we often see them while we're around the ice as well. But I've told you that already. So I think enough of all that. I think I'll leave it there. Um, hopefully you're not all fast asleep by now. And um, very happy to ask any questions if you have any about um, anything, wrangle, life, anything you know. Thank you very much. Mark, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, goodness, uh, I remember many of those encounters. In fact, almost everyone. And uh, how could you forget those encounters? I know, I know, I know. They're amazing. They're life, they? they're life changing encounters, a lot of those, aren't they? Oh, my goodness gracious. Just absolutely stunning. What a phenomenal place. Um, I'm looking forward to going back, I have to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, all sorts of interesting and um, and exciting questions that we've got. Oh yeah. I'm going to throw in your general in your general direction. I might have if a slurp of wine. God, blimey! Talk about professional. Where's there my beer? The, there was nothing in the um, brief about drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I need I need to remember for the uh, for the next one you do. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, a number of people have asked about um, sea conditions mm -hmm. um, and I know that it, it, when when I went well we went together the first time I know it was something I was quite concerned about but um, do you want to just uh, kind of throw in a, a few thoughts on that on sea conditions yeah, sure, yeah. someone has said yeah. something like you know what are the sailing conditions like for a lightweight sailor that's from David um, anyway and one, one or two other similar variants of that well, I must admit, I spend a lot of my life on ships and boats and I'm a lightweight sailor too, because I, I suffer from seasickness along with everybody else. No, but even Darwin suffered from seasickness. He was ill for much of the five years of the voyage of the Beagle. So it's, it's a big concern for a lot of people I know. This particular trip, um, it's nothing like going to the Antarctic where you have to cross the Drake Passage. Um, a lot of it's luck, of course. Um, and we've only got the experience of, of three trips. But most of the, the traveling is in coastal waters. And uh, there's that one hop across to Wrangell, which is a short little journey, you know, um, let's say 87 miles or something um, from Koliuchin to the, the nearest point on Wrangell. Um, and that has always been calm. When you're in the ice, it's calm. Um, you know, when you're breaking away through the ice, it's nice and calm. So I would say, it's very hard to, you know, you can't guarantee anything, but the conditions are actually pretty good most of the time. You might get a bit of chop on a windy day, but because you're not doing any big sea crossings, it's never really a problem. So it's one of those trips where you don't have to worry about seasickness too much, I would say. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think I am probably the world's worst sailor, um, as various of my pals would be able to... Uh, uh, would we'll be able to testify to that. Um, I am absolutely the world's worst, and I haven't had any problems on on the Wrangell trip no, at all. Not me. Um, it's been well, touch wood. It's been uh, been as calm as you like. Um, before I ask you the next question, Mark, I'm just going to ask everybody who's on board our call a question. I'm just going to launch a poll, um, which they can answer whilst I'm asking you the next question, um, um, which is about um, getting to Wrangell. Um, or rather getting to um, getting to Anadir um, and of course how we actually do it um, I mean I know I, you know you and I can chat about that I can I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to chip in um, but of course you know you showed that we go to Moscow we actually spend the night in Moscow and then we fly across to Anadir but you might want to say a bit more about that yeah we um well yeah we it's um I've got this three and a half hour flight to Moscow, something like that. Yeah, um, something back there or thereabouts. And, a night and we spend a nice night in Moscow, don't we? We stay in a hotel Moscow. and have a lovely evening there. Yeah, it's a lovely city, Moscow. Lots to see. You know, we generally in the hotel, we can walk to Red Square and 
see all the all the famous sites and get a feel for the city. Then we um, have this long flight to Anadir, um, which is a it's an experience. Um, I mean, the, the safety record of the airline is by is good. There's nothing to worry about there. It's just not great service, and um, it's there's no no nothing other than cattle class, and it's very much cattle class. So. You know, we've actually got to taking our own sandwiches and, and making mm. it into a big laugh. So it's an eight hour flight and um, it's not the most comfortable flight in the world. But, you know, to me, it's, 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 it's like going across the Drake Passage. People talk about, well, you know, can't you just fly? And you can indeed fly to King George Island and miss the Drake Passage going to the Antarctic. But that's part of the experience. Yeah. It's part of getting there. And in that case, yeah. you see lots of wildlife along the way. You don't see wildlife on the flight, but you get to fly across the length of Russia. And just because it's slightly uncomfortable and the, the staff aren't that friendly, um, doesn't really matter. And, and then um, before you know it, you're in Anadir and it's fantastic from then on in. So that would be my um, short answer. The flight's an experience rather than a luxury. We, we, we did have a friendly, um, a friendly member of flight crew once, didn't we? Once we did, once, yes. Yeah. I think it was, I think one person but was friendly. It's, uh, we should have you had to answer that question before you get all the people wanting the, um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's nothing at all to worry about. It's just the flight, no, is, no, to I be agree. honest, is, is a, an interesting flight. But so, you know, the bit in Moscow is wonderful. And then we go straight from the airport to the um, ship in Anadir. And then you, the, one, one thing I love about traveling on ships, of course, is you, you unpack in your cabin and that's it, done, you, you're yeah. there. And for two yeah. weeks, you, you wake up somewhere different every day and um, all your stuff's with you. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a, that flight, as I say, it's, a, it's, I think it's wonderful to fly across the length of Russia. Well, it's amazing. And of course, um, uh, well, you'll remember this as, as well as I do, but on, on the flight on the way back, which of course we're doing um, very much in, in daylight hours, all you know, buzzed up from having come back from Wrangell. I mean, it's hours before we even see any evidence of human habitation. We are just flying over wilderness for hours and hours and hours on end, and that just that in itself is is an extraordinary experience. I mean, a wonderful experience. I love it. Yes, and to think that people living in that wilderness think that where we're going is remote and wild. I love that. Yeah, I know, I know. Isn't it? Isn't it brilliant? Um, so look, uh, uh, other other questions. Um, uh, getting on and off the zodiacs. Um, how, how do we do that? Um, someone is suggesting that, um, or, or no, someone was posing the question. Linda has posed the question as to whether we go down the side of the ship doing using a rope ladder. <laughs> no, we jump. We have to jump. Um, <laughs> no, it's all very civilized. There's a there's a proper walkway that's lowered down. Um, and you literally just, um, you get logged, I was going to say ticked off, you get logged off and yeah. um, you walk down the walkway, which is a very shallow angle holding onto the sides. And there'll be um, usually two sailors down at the bottom and somebody in the Zodiac and they help you to step over from the step onto the Zodiac and then down into the, the base of the Zodiac. So. It's, um, you know, we, we run through it all and the first time it's um, quite entertaining. Everybody has their different techniques and things go wrong and so on. It's just a bit of fun after you've done it once and you realise how easy it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's just a doddle. You, you walk, I mean, I walk on with a great big, my camera bag weighs, I think it's 27 kilos is the average weight. So I walk on with that um, and just step on and we... Um, you know, we're just very careful, there's no rush. Uh, in, in, everybody's very caring, all the staff are very caring. And uh, if you're a bit nervous, they'll help you and take your time. You step onto the, the um, blown up bit of the Zodiac and then down into the bottom, all being held by other people and you sit down and you're there. So it's, it's very simple. Very it is, I, yeah, I, I agree. Um, although Jan, um, who used to be in the Navy, says transferring from a rope ladder is much more fun. Um, <laughs> but, well, we, I'm sure we could organise that for Jan. <laughs> yeah, um, no problem would do anything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we've had one or two questions about um, whether the trip is being scheduled for 2022 and whether there are single supplements and so on and so forth. Um, yes, the trip is scheduled for 2022. It's it's on our website. 
Um, it, it will be operational in 2022. Mark mentioned we'll be on the Schakowsky um, and we can send you um, more information about that. Um, safety, uh, Mark, on Wrangell Island. Um, so far, we've managed to come back with everybody. Um, yeah. And uh, everybody has been very well looked after, but there are you know, serious safety considerations, aren't there? And um, it might be worth just uh, throwing in a few thoughts on that and, and, and how we deal with that. Of course, we've got the Rangers with us who are a very important part of that, of that uh, operation. Well, safety wise, I mean, um, the, 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 I suppose the obvious worry would be polar bears and um, that wouldn't worry me at all. We're very careful before going ashore to do a proper search um, and to land in places where we've got a good wide view. We're not going to land somewhere where there, there are places hidden from view. Um, some of us staff and rangers go ashore first and we basically case the joint to make sure there's nothing hiding. Um, and then the staff have rifles, not that we ever want to use them, but um, as, a, as an absolute last resort. We have people on the periphery of where we are doing our photography or watching or whatever we're doing um, with binoculars, searching for any approaching polar bears. Um, so from that point of view, it's, I would say it's totally safe. No, nothing to worry about at all. The only other risks are risks as in normal life, you know, tripping over or yeah. getting ill with something else while you're on the ship. And um, that would be true of any polar voyage anywhere in the Arctic or the Antarctic. Yeah. We do have a, a very basic hospital on the ship and um, there's a ship's doctor and um, that, you know, that we're just very careful. If anybody does get ill, um, then we've never had to do it yet on these trips, but um, we, we would find a way of evacuating them, getting to somewhere. But the reality is it's remote. So if somebody had a bad accident, then, you know, we would obviously do what we can to make them safe and secure on the ship and then get to help as quickly as we can. But um, there's nothing particular about this trip that would mean we would have an accident, just normal stuff like, as I say, somebody tripping or, um, you know, banging their head or something like that. And uh, touch wood, you know, we've been lucky, nothing. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Um, and um, a number of people are asking about, um, uh, if you like, uh, sort of com comfort on board and, and, and food and things like that. I've had that question from from half a dozen different people. I mean, the the, the, the food is to die for, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's just absolutely well, exceptional. It's, fan it's fantastic. I mean, it's not a luxury ship. No. You, know, you no. don't. We did get somebody ask once they could book a, a cabin with a with an outdoor balcony. <laughs> you don't get <laughs> yeah. that. Um, it's comfortable. It's all very clean and the cabins are very comfortable. You've got everything you need, all the facilities you need. Um, the staff, as I say, are very, very lovely staff. Nothing too much trouble. Plenty of staff, so everything gets done and everyone gets whatever they need. Food, as Chris said, is amazing. Um, it's, it's really high standard, high quality, good restaurant quality food and lots of it and um, snacks and hot drinks and everything you could possibly need. It's, um, it, it's one of the joys, I shouldn't say this, but it's one of the joys of the trip. It's, it's, it's like eating at a good restaurant every day. It's, it's outstandingly good. One is, you know, and I've been on many, many uh, polar ships over the years in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and it's some of the best food I've ever had on any of them. It's great, and, 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 and life on board is, is fun, isn't it? We, we do, again, one or two people are, have asked about that, you know, in terms of talks and presentations and, and so on, which we do um, in the evenings and, uh, you know, um, uh, photographic tuition and, and so on, should people want it? Oh, it is, it's wonderful. It's, it's just good fun. I mean, we, we're trying to get the balance. So, you know, it, it's got to be um, informative and educational. I think that's important. So, yeah. We do have a lot of lectures and they're, they're informal lectures and they sort of depend on what we've seen during the day and what we hope to see the next day. They're all relevant to what we're doing. Um, they might be just a chat in the bar or a proper lecture with slides in the lecture theatre. Um, and um, they're, they're fun, they, they're, they're informative, but the idea is they're fun because you know, everyone's there on holiday. Yeah. Um, there's always people, experts around on all sorts of different subjects, whether it's history or photography or whales or bears or 
or geology or anything to be able to sit and, and ask questions. You know, the staff are generally always in the bar in the evenings and they eat, we, we, we eat with everybody, of course. That's one of the great pleasures. So we'll, everyone's always on hand if there's any questions. Um, and there's plenty of opportunity while we're traveling just to sit down together um, at one of the tables in the bar or the dining room and um, talk about stuff. It's just a, it's a, it's a really lovely atmosphere. We, we tend to steer it towards where people are interested. So if there's a lot of keen photographers on board, we'll make sure they get whatever tuition they need, whatever help they need, you know, whether it's fixing a camera or advice on how to photograph polar bears or whatever. Um, everyone's interested in bears, so we'll make sure we cover bears very well and um, have a lot of laughs and fun along the way. It, it's a, it is a great atmosphere and it's, a, it's just the right size, you know, 50 odd people, not odd people, but 50 I was going to say, people. that's not the emphasis <laughs> of what you were saying, is it odd, 50, but 50, 50 people. people. You know, it's a nice number because you get to know everybody personally, you get to know everybody's names, and um, it's nice enough to everyone to split up and have their own space on shore, have their own space on the deck, but also it's a good sized group for that camaraderie and um, and just having lots of fun. Yeah, no, well, no, we have a good giggle, don't we? Um, there was uh, uh, been one or two questions about whales. Um, Kate has asked um, belugas. Um, any chance at sea or just in Anadir? And will we get our share of humpbacks? I mean, we, we thus far we have largely had belugas in Anadir, haven't we? I don't think we've had them anywhere else so far. I remember. Yeah, they do. They do occur around the rest of that coast, um, but we we haven't. I mean, they, and they do get seen occasionally on those trips. I don't think we've seen them no, except in Anadir. Yeah. The Anadir sightings have been fantastic. I know they've been brilliant. We're there long the boat, enough, you know, to actually through. make make the most of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, humpbacks, I would be very, very surprised if we ever do a trip there and we don't see loads of humpbacks and greys and bowheads. Um, and, you know, then we can see other stuff as well. So we sometimes see um, fin, as I said, and minke whales and, uh, and killer whales. And, um, you know, there are bound to be some surprises along the way as well. So whales are, are quite a big part of it. While you're at sea and travelling, especially that trip from... Um, Coleuchin Island when we just cut across to Wrangell that can be really good for whales and if it, it, um, you've got a schedule but we're not sticking to an hour by hour schedule and I think that's one of the key points the whole point about this is to see loads and to enjoy it so if we stumble upon whales you know the idea is we'll stop and uh, we'll take our time and enjoy them be mad to say oh no no we've got to We've got to be so and so here at this place by this time. Yeah. There's a certain element that we've got to pick up the ranges by a certain time and so on, but there's loads of flexibility. So we just make the most of what happens. And as you know, with wildlife, you can't you can't plan much at all. You just know that this is a great area for whales. We'll leave plenty of time for it and hope we find them. So um I guess perhaps what one one of the one of the last goodness there I've, I've got so many questions I don't know where to look um questions coming in at me from all directions um um w one of the last questions perhaps should be I'm sort of conscious it's we're, we're cruising towards nine o'clock but um um one or two people have asked about Kamchatka brown bear now we've done three trips I know we've had cracking Kamchatka brown bears on a couple of them I can't remember if we've, we've had them on all three but of course that's not you know that's not the focus of the trip specifically but uh, not a, a, a super thing to see nonetheless. Yeah I think there's, there's a pretty good chance of seeing Kamchatka brown bear um, they're in Chukotka we're going to the right places we've got a lot of people looking um, you know one of the lessons I've learned doing these trips the more people out on deck or in the bridge looking the more we see we've got all the experts and we're all out there and the naturalists are out there and so on um, but it's still easy to miss stuff. So they're there. And, and as you say, we've had some good luck with, with brown bears. I would, I would hope that we would see them on, on pretty much every trip. Yeah. So, so maybe, um, maybe we should just end with um, some photographic thoughts. Um, because a number of people have asked about photographic gear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of um, lenses to take and so on and so forth. I, I mean, perhaps without getting too detailed, one or two people have asked about, um, you know, whether it's so cold that your batteries freeze kind of thing. Um, 
but it, it, it's probably worth uh, touching on the photographic side of things. I mean, we, we've always managed to get everyone's photographic gear on board the on board the planes and so on and so forth. And of course, as a company, Wildlife Worldwide will provide people with a lot more information about that yeah. pre-departure. But um, you might want to just chat a little bit more about that. Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I take so much kit, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and I'd rather have a bag full of camera kit than than socks and pants. <laughs> but, yes, that um, may go some way to... That's uh, my, my sort of yeah. measure, but which, which sort of shows that, you know, we can get it. it the airline does have restrictions, as all airlines do, but we've always got everybody's stuff on with no problem. Um, I take um, generally two camera bodies and um, a 600mm lens for the long stuff, using a tripod on the deck of the ship and a tripod on the shore. Uh, the lens I use the most is the 100 to 400. It's a I'm Canon at the moment, um, which is fantastic for Zodiac cruises and all sorts of other stuff, um, and a wide angle. Um, I think if you're going to take, you know, a minimal amount of kit, I would definitely take a, a wider angle for the, the some of the scenery and a, a medium zoom, 100 to 400 would be ideal, but that sort of range zoom and that would cover you for most things. Um, there's a few cases where we see wonderful bears and we can't get close to them because the ice is too thick or for whatever reason. That's when I'm using my 600. Um, but then my, my philosophy also nowadays is you don't always have to get in close. You know, there's this thing that uh, people who bought, you know, you remortgage your house to buy a 600 mil lens. Therefore, you feel you've always got to have the animals filling the frame. But actually, some of the best shots um, on this trip include some of the environment, like I showed with that Kamchatka brown bear in that wonderful yeah. wilderness environment, the walruses on the ice flows with the island behind. Um, so you don't need long, really long lenses to get shots like that. And to me, that shows that it's it's these animals in Russia, in Wrangell, rather than they could be anywhere. Um, so I, I would say, you know, you could keep it quite simple. And then you need a waterproof bag um, when we're getting in the Zodiacs. Even in the calm conditions, you can get spray um, coming in if we're traveling fast. And you can get rain sometimes and so on. So you've got to be prepared. If you go ashore in bright sunshine, you've got to be ready just in case the weather turns. Um, and I think I think that's about it. It's, um, you know, we can have lessons on board about processing and editing yep. and how to, you know, how to expose for polar bears and all that kind of thing. Um, it, it's all fairly straightforward. I think you don't need a huge amount of kit, really. Keep it simple. Yeah, I've seen so many people, and I, I used to be one of these people traveling with, with so much stuff, and they spend so much time deciding what lens to use and changing lens, and then that's when you get the, the dust pops that I've missed on those photos. And if you just keep it simple, a couple of lenses, wide angle, you know, good range zoom, then you'll cover most bases, and it makes you think creatively as well. If you have too many lenses, you're always trying to think what lens, you just got one main lens then you're thinking outside the box of it how can i use this lens how can i make this yeah. shot work and um, i think that's one of the tricks it makes you think more creatively so simple is, is definitely good cool mark look thank you so much that's absolutely wonderful um there are so many other questions um lots of specifics about um the departure date um, and when it is and so on we will get back to everybody that's asked those questions paul has asked a question about maps i'll come back to you on a, on that one paul um i'll come back to you directly um mark and i've struggled to find maps but there are there are maps lurking around various places um lots of people have asked about clothing and so on um but we'll come back to you guys on on all of that um mark could i trouble you to put on that final slide shows the um shows the brochure um so just uh just a reminder to everybody about um brian's uh, talk tomorrow if you want to see um <laughs> or, or don't as the case may be <laughs> um brian's talk tomorrow about uh, best of botswana um and then a talk about canada then of course we've got europe's bears next week um but um I have to say an enormous thank you to Mark on behalf of, of everybody that has been on board yeah. this evening. And I know I speak on Mark's behalf 
um, in thanking everybody that's been on board with us this evening um, for taking the time to to spend your evening with us. We, we, we really appreciate it. And more than anything else, we would love to have you on board um, our Wrangell Island departure in, in 2022. Um, we've had enormous fun um, on the tr previous trips that we've done and uh, Mark and I are both, both desperate to get back there and, uh, and 2022 will be, will be the time. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. we'll see you all again very soon.